Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Huber, uh, who is a professor at the uh, South uh, Africa, uh, the University of Western Cape uh, University. Uh, and he's going to tell us uh, how long even the largest impact craters uh, on Earth can survive. Uh, I hope we will have no more of the um, of the technical problems. Uh, either Matthew right now has a very focused face or his video froze down again. Uh, Matthew, can you um, try to Can you speak? see me? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, can, can you hear and... Uh, so can you hear Matthew? Uh, guys, because I okay. think froze down on my on my end. Okay, perfect. Then please, Matthew, start, and I will try to come back somehow. Thank you. All right. Um, then I'll get. Uh, you going. have. Uh, met, sorry, one before you start. Uh, you have twenty minutes uh, for the entire show, and I will. Um, I will let you know when the 10 minutes have passed. Uh, uh, please ask questions uh, in the chat. Thank you. Good. Um, so uh, after that wonderful talk by Oz, I'm going to continue talking about impact craters on Earth before we fly off to other planets. Um, and this work that I'm presenting has been in collaboration with quite a number of different uh, talented individuals. Uh, who are at other institutions. Now, Oz was talking about the terrestrial record of impact craters as compared to other planets. And one thing we know about the terrestrial record of the 200 impact structures that we know about on Earth, they tend to be concentrated in areas where there's good exposure of old rocks and a high density of geologists. And that's partially the effect of the preservation characteristics of craters and also the ways that we look for them. One other thing about the preservation of impact structures, if we look at impacts on a timeline, we see that the oldest impact structures only go back to sort of the mid to even early Proterozoic. Um, we only have a handful of impact structures at 2000 million years. And even though we have evidence from ejecta deposits of Archean impact events, we do not have any Archean impact structures preserved. So the highest pr probability of preserving these old craters, of course, is going to be the largest impact structures. And on Earth, the largest impact uh, structures we have are going to be in the form of impact basins. These are well studied from other planets. This is a model um, made by LPI based on lunar craters. But we can see that you have this uplifted peak ring structure and you have a melt sheet in filling the structure and you have fractures below the crater floor. So this is on the scale of the entire crust and we can see in principle that these structures should leave a large crustal profile. On Earth, we have three impact structures that are this size. Uh, as Oz was just talking about Chicxulub, uh, Chicxulub is one of the three largest on Earth. On top, we have an artist's rendering of what Chicxulub might have looked like, a very famous image. Um, and on bottom, we have a gravity signature. The reason why we have to look at Chicxulub that way is because Chicxulub is completely buried. It's well preserved, but not exposed on the surface. The second is the Sudbury impact structure in Canada, which you can see doesn't look anything like a crater. It's been folded in half, and that's sort of how it's preserved, but has experienced significant tectonic deformation on its southern side. And finally, there's the Fratiford impact structure, which we'll be talking about. Um, on this map, I've only included the geological uh, units that are older than the Vratiford event, and you can see it's only a handful. Um, most of the space that's in gray, this hillshade behind the map, that's where there's younger rocks covering the structure. Um, so how do these impact basins form? 
So this is a numerical model that was made a few years ago by Gareth Collins. And if you're not familiar with looking at these, this uh, half hemisphere here represents the impactor. This is all cut in half. So you can imagine that this is a circle and you can mirror everything you see on the right hand side of the image to the left. And these uh, units here represent the crust. This blue box is the same as this blue box. So you can see how deformation occurs. So we see that when the impact occurs, it pushes down to depths of 20 or more kilometers in the crust and then causes uplift that rises the land surface 10 kilometers above the pre-impact surface and then eventually results in this overturned limb. And we can see lots of deformation going on below the crater floor. Now at some depth, um, we see the deformation becomes less extreme. At the greatest depths, there's a little bit of uplift of the mantle at the very bottom of the crust, and that's going to be significant. So um, when we talk about these impact events, they cause a lot of changes and transformations to the target rocks. And this has been well studied at Chicxulub because um, it has been thoroughly studied with geophysics, and also there's been the recent IODP-ICDP drill core expedition 364, um, where about a kilometer of material from Chicxulub's upper peak ring was drilled. So this uh, drill core was examined for its physical properties. So we have a stratigraphic column that shows the changes in lithology. A lot of this is granitic and cross-cut by fractures or uh, melt dikes. There's a little bit of impact melt on top and then uh, some sedimentary rock capping all of that. And we can see that the physical properties, the velocity of these rocks um, uh, is, is radically different than what's expected for a normal granite. The porosity of these granite rocks are 10% or more. Um, and the density of these granites is uh, as low as two and far low, two grams per cubic centimeter, which is far lower than what a granite should ever be. So these changes to the physical properties of these target rocks have been linked to the passage of the shock wave and the uplift of the peak ring. This has been compared with numerical modeling where we can see that the, the modeled porosity based on um, this type of diagram shows that we would have an increased porosity much more abundant near the top of the crater. Going down, the increase in porosity is less extreme. In the case of Chicxulub, we've drilled into the very top of the peak ring. And so we know a little bit about what's going on in this uppermost part of the impact crater. And we can link that to geophysics and, and physical properties. And we can say something about what that means. But we don't know how deeply those types of effects extend. What happens far below the crater floor in these large impact basins? And for that, Vredefort becomes the ideal place to look. Vredefort is about 2 billion years old. Originally, it had a diameter up to 300 kilometers. It was at least as big as the Chicxulub impact, if not bigger. But there's been multiple studies that have shown that it's been eroded by between 8 and 10 kilometers. So all of the uppermost features of the impact structure have been erosionally removed. We can see that in the example of the melt sheet. So underneath the melt sheet, there's fractures that open in the crater floor, allowing the melt to descend deep below the crater floor. We have those preserved as these granifier dikes, these impact melt dikes. But all of the melt sheet has been eroded away. And so we're only left with this very deep cross section of what this huge impact structure looks like. We've measured how far below the surface these dikes extend, and we found that for most of them, if there were five meters of erosion, just five, then they would completely disappear. They hardly extend below the subsurface, and we've measured at this point all of the dikes in the middle of the impact structure, and they all have the same effect. Just a tiny bit more erosion, and we would lose a lot of evidence we have of the Vredefort melt sheet. So this gives us an opportunity. We want to know 
about these Archean impact craters. Can we preserve an Archean crater? And so can Vredefort tell us about preservation of old craters? Well, we wanted to know about that. So we decided to measure the same geophysical properties of a transect through Fredefort. So we collected a suite of samples in an approximate transect through the impact structure based on where we had good exposure and good outcrop and good access to the outcrops. We collected the samples. Um, we filled our car with as many rocks as we could carry. And then we uh, sent them off to uh, Core Labs Incorporated to measure the physical properties. And we did um, point counting on the fin sections to determine the original mineralogy and the exact rock composition. Most of our samples were granites. We also had some charnakites uh, with pyroxene um, as, uh, within the granitic structure. And um, a few that fell into the TTG category, we had two samples that we believe are impact melt, which we wanted to measure as a comparison with uh, the various other things that were present. And uh, a couple of the rocks had small scale pseudotacolites in them. Um, the pseudotacolites, it turned out, didn't make very much difference in the end. So we took our measured results and we compared them with the theoretically expected values for the physical properties that we derive from um, numerical modeling of the mineralogy uh, based on the point counting. So um, we knew the percentage of the minerals we should have, we knew the densities of those minerals, and so we could uh, project the maximum and minimum density that the rock should have. If these rocks were severely shock metamorphosed, we would expect that there would be a significant de density decrease compared to um, the theoretical values. Um, these first few samples on the left, those are literature values. And um, the basic story here is that the densities of these rocks are not strongly affected. They're not very far removed from the theoretical values. So we're not seeing a major change in density of these target rocks underneath Fredefort. We can also look at the velocities. Again, these are reference materials on the far left. And then the, uh, the other points are the Fredefort materials. And we see they're falling very nicely between the ranges of expected values. Meaning that, meaning that they were not severely affected by the shock process or at least that it's not been preserved. We can also see this with porosity. The granites in the Chicxulub drill core had 10% or more porosity. Uh, the granites in this study, the maximum we measured was about 1.2% porosity, um, which is not particularly high. That's in the range that we can expect for normal granites on the surface of the earth. So we decided to rerun the model that was made um, of Fredefort in 2005 by Boris Ivanov. And this is set up similarly to the last numerical model that we observed that was for Chicxulub. Here again, this is the impactor. It's going to strike vertically. The uh, blue to yellow coloration is showing us porosity. And so we see a very similar development of the impact. We see the uh, formation of the peak ring structure and the overturning of the uppermost strata during the collapse of the central uplift. And we can see very high porosity values in this overturned limb, but within the granites, we see that the increase in porosity is not so huge especially if we come down to the 10 kilometer level. So if we make a cross section through this at 10 kilometers depth, we find that in this innermost 20 kilometers, which is about the range that we were studying, the increase in porosity that's expected is much less than 1%. So um, there probably was not a huge increase in porosity. There probably wasn't a huge change in physical properties 
um, at the onset of the crater at the 10 kilometer depth level. But whatever difference there was, that pore space has been closed in the intervening 2 billion years. Another thing we can look at is the gravity signature. And we can see the gravity signature of the impact basins like Chicxulub show this clear structure over a wide area. Well, if we look at the Capval Craton in South Africa, Fredefort is on the Capval Craton, and you can definitely pick out where Fredefort is. If you spot it, Fredefort is up here. It is an anomaly to be sure, but it is not even nearly the largest anomaly on the Capval Craton, and um, could easily be mistaken for something else, or even entirely overlooked. So if we zoom in on this gravity anomaly, we can see there is a strong uh, peak in the crater, uh, in the peak ring rim, um, and in the middle of the structure there's a little bit of a bullseye, but we can see that this is defined by a broad peak. This is not a, a narrow feature or a sharp feature that's associated with the uppermost rocks. If we take the slope of this, we can see that there is a little bit of preservation in the very innermost part of the crater of this initial structure, but when we move out to the outer parts of the structure, that signature disappears. This is just noise. Furthermore, if we take any of our physical properties and compare them to gravity, there's no trend. There's no correlation between the gravity signature and any of the physical properties that we measured. So what does this tell us about survivability of impact craters? We've had about 10 kilometers of erosion at Fredefort, and that has removed almost all of the geophysical evidence of the impact. Now, the typical crustal erosion rates are between 5 and 50 meters per million years if a surface is continuously exposed. So that means that 10 kilometers of erosion can occur in as little as 200 million years, but will almost certainly happen within 2 billion years. So if that's the only process going on, then it may be impossible for Archean impact craters to be preserved. The only way that you could preserve older craters is if there is some unusual process happening to specially preserve the crater. So what can Vredefort tell us about the preservation of impact craters? First, the geophysical properties at Vredefort are indistinguishable from an uncharted terrain. The controls on the geophysical profile are probably very deep things like uplift of the moho rather than the change in the physical properties of the shallow rocks. And also, if we erode Vredefort just a tiny bit more, maybe even as little as one kilometer more, we would lose almost all of the evidence that this is an impact. Vredefort is the largest impact structure on Earth, and it's if it can be completely wiped out after 10 kilometers of erosion, this essentially means that any impact structure on Earth, regardless of its size, if it's eroded by 10 kilometers, will be almost impossible to identify. And so Archean impact structures can only be preserved if there is unusual preservation. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's still literally one minute uh, for questions. Uh, and I have a quick question. How uh, would you think this influences our uh, astrobiological uh, understanding of the very early Earth? Um, well, I think that it may suggest that if impact craters are habitats, we may not find direct evidence of that. We may just be stuck having to infer that because these very old structures are not going to be around to directly sample. Perfect. Thank you very much. Not very uh, happy answer, but uh, <laughs> whatever the science tells us, 